You don't go there because all your friends are there. Your friends, if they're in a true church, good. But if your friends are in a false church, leave your friends. Call them on the phone. Get where you can know Jesus and where you can learn about his word. There are no brownie pound points for loyalty. Tell your neighbor, say, loyalty can get you in trouble. Say, loyalty can get you in trouble. Romans 12 and 9, another problem. <laughs> I got somebody helping me today. I like that. <laughs> That's my Baptist brother right there. Y'all leave him alone. Notice Romans 12 and 9. Where the Bible says, let love be without dissimulation, without division, without, without separatism or favoritism. Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love and honor, preferring one another. A dark mind can't do that. If God is not in your brain, you can't love like you ought to love. Because love is more about giving than getting. Husbands, 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 husbands. I said love is more about getting than about giving. Wives, 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 wives. Love is more about giving than about getting. I'm not asking you when you love, what are you getting? I'm asking you what you're giving. Y'all, nobody don't hear me today. Love is about giving. In fact, if your marriage is good, then somebody said marriage is 50-50. That's a lie. That's a lie. That's a lie. Somebody said, well, Pastor Marshall, should be 50-50. That's a lie. Marriage is not 50-50. Marriage is 100% versus 100%. It's 100%, 100%. In marriage, you're supposed to give 100, and they're supposed to give 100. That's love. You're supposed to be able to give your love without worrying about what comes back. And you're not supposed to hold your love and wait for them to show their love before you show them your love. Come on, somebody. Love is love. Amen. And even when it comes down to romance, the same way. If you ready, go on and ask. Who going to initiate it? You initiate it. You want it? Y'all ain't with me now. Wait a minute. Maybe the singles ought to leave. Maybe the singles ought to go. Maybe we ought to let them out. Because I'm about to say something. I'm about to help somebody now. In marriage, counsel got nervous. Pastor Marsh, I'm tired of being always the one to initiate it. Like that's a problem. All I got to say, initiate, initiate, initiate. Start the car. As long as you can drive it, that's all right. As long as it go, what, who do, who make a difference? Who step on the pedal? Wait a minute, somebody. I didn't know I was going to turn into marriage counseling. Who, what difference do it make? Who step on the pedal? As long as the car go where you want the car to go. As long as it's driving where you want to drive. What difference do it make? Who started? Who turned the key? I just wish my wife would initiate one time. Forget that. I don't wait for mine. I turn the key. Come on, somebody help me. I turn the key. Long as she say, yes, I'm driving. I'm driving. In love, you love. Love's got to be sincere. You love somebody. You don't look to see what they're going to give back to you. It's got to be that way in marriage. It's got to be that way in the church. Amen. And love, and, and often, often, most of the time, when you give love out, love is returned to you. Now, be very careful, because people with a darkened mind, there are people with a darkened mind, even psychologists talk about it, believe it or not, it's true, that are incapable of love. And the trouble with some of you, you're trying to get with someone who is incapable of love. Why are they incapable? I don't know. Something in their background, something they didn't learn, something's wrong, but they're incapable of love. Therefore, no matter how much love you show, they give no love back. That's somebody to quit the date. Stop the date. You done paid for 10 meals. They ain't paid for one yet. It's time to stop. Got time to stop. You keep putting something in, you ain't getting nothing back, nothing at all. Some are incapable of love. It's not going to work. Somebody knows what I'm talking about. Somebody knows what I'm talking about. No matter how nice you are, they don't smile. No matter how good you are, they take your love for granted. Come on, somebody. Somebody right here now has got somebody taking their love for granted, and you're still trying to work out a relationship with them because you're so desperate. Give that up and go to Jesus. Get with somebody who loves you. Get with somebody who loves you. When you love them, love comes back. You should have saw Sister Moss last night. At that part, she was standing up talking about how, she, how much she loved me. She said I was a lover. She said, I was a husband. Oh, bunch of that. I like the lover part. That's what's just sticking in my mind. I said, lover. I'm a brother. I'm a pastor. She said all that stuff. But that's because I treated her so nice. I, I just did. I treated her nice. I treated her nice. If you want your spouse to act nice, act nice to them. Amen. 
and act nice to folks in the church. Not just folks that are on your team or part of your program or that are your favorites. Make everybody, treat everybody like your favorites. We're the body of Christ. We are family. Treat everybody in the family the same way. Am I right about it? Let love be without dissimulation. Don't have that phony, fake kind of, separatistic kind of love. Just because you ain't in my clique. Click everybody in. The more the merrier. Click them on in. Bring them in. Amen? All right. Turn to Mark 9 and 42. Mark 9, 42. Hope y'all got a Bible. No God in your brain. Hard to love when you have no God in your brain. And when you have no God in your brain, you can really do some foolish stuff. Huh? Mark 9, 42. Now, this is the New Testament. And you don't expect to find something this hard in the New Testament. This sounds like Old Testament stuff, but it's not. Where Jesus said, this is Jesus. Mark 9, 42. This is what he said. Mark 9, 42. Y'all got it? And whosoever shall offend one of these little ones that believe in me, it's Jesus. Wait a minute. Okay. Whosoever shall offend one of these little ones that believe in me, it is better for him or her that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he was cast into the sea. That's the New Testament. That's Jesus. That's what he said. In other words, don't mess with my people. Don't cause somebody because of your actions to get into sin. Be careful what you do. In fact, what it says is not to cause them to stumble. You should make sure that you are living your life as a Christian. Talking about you saved. You're going to heaven. Oh, I love Jesus. You should be living, living your life in a way that doesn't cause somebody else to stumble. Huh? Wait a minute. I got to talk about it. Now. I got to preach it. I got to preach it. How are you raising your kids? What do those kids see you do? What are you showing those kids? How many men have to come into your house before you realize you're corrupting your kids? Huh? Leaving them with somebody 12 years old talking about that's a babysitter. Are you out of your mind? Smoking around them? Smoking weed around them? Talking about you need it for your nerves. You're going to need something for your nerves later. Cursing around them? Putting them down all the time? You better watch it because notice again. Notice again, whosoever shall offend one of these little ones that believe in me, it was better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he were cast into the sea. And those millstones were big, man. They were used for grinding things in the first century. Can you imagine your neck be turned into one of those? Jesus says, it's that you are responsible when you lead someone in a direction that they should not go and you're supposed to be a child of God. Amen. Say to your neighbor, say, point to your neighbor and say, what are you showing others? Say, what are you showing others? I grew up with a family where I never heard my daddy curse. Never. Okay. And yet he never cursed, but he never went to church. I think he went to church about two times in my life, but he didn't curse. Why? Not because he was all in the Bible. Not because he was all in the church, because he wasn't. But he knew that he did not want me to curse like he cursed. Now, you say, well, how did you find out he cursed? I found out one day. Me and my brother found out one day that he cursed. We are back in the alley. We were working. This is back when you had to build cement behind your, some of y'all remember, where you had to put cement behind your garage because rats was getting in. And the city said you had to put that down there. So daddy had us come out there and dig a hole so he could put the cement in back in the day. How many of y'all remember back in the day? Y'all don't want to talk about rats back in the day. That reminds y'all of what got in your house was eating your food. I know. Yeah. <laughs> You had so many rats, they was your friends sitting down waiting for dinner, for breakfast. Come on, I, I'll leave that alone. I'll leave that alone. But we're back there in the cement. We're putting it down, and we were down there working. And my father was working, and he hit us. He hurt himself, either his hand or his foot or something. And he said, he said, blank and blank, blank. And me and my brother just stopped what we was doing, just like that, because we heard those curse words. The only people in the alley were me, my brother, and my daddy. So we looked up at my father, and he looked down at us. Hey, boy. But he had enough sense to know there's certain things he didn't want the kids to see. My mother and my father, we never heard them argue. Never. 
Never heard of Mark. We never did. 